Baruch Hashim, my granddaughter, one of my granddaughters cut my hair yesterday because we're still in lockdown. I've been in lockdown for nearly a year. How are you? As you see, Baruch Hashim, we're doing well. Getting younger. Good. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> Young at heart. We've, got, we've got, had our ninth great grandchild, great grandchild born. Mazel Tov. I've got one. And they're in Yerushalayim now. Good excuse for you to come and visit. Okay. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Mitch! I'm, uh, I'm happy to eavesdrop on all these private conversations. So uh, nice to hear everybody's doing well and getting to know each other. Um. We're going to uh, be uh, muting everybody shortly when we start, but uh, you'll be able to unmute yourself if you have an important question. <clears throat> oh, that's better. I'm happy to make it interactive. I might even ask you a question or two and ask you to respond, uh, either uh, by unmuting yourself or perhaps on the chat line. So, um, yes. Mm. Only because we have uh, interfer environmental interferences that we have to mute everybody, which I will do. In so enjoy the chats for another um, minute or half a minute, and then we're going to mute. Otherwise. <clears throat> Can you? Okay, once again, just to tell you that um, I'm not putting on any screen share of the text, I will read it. But if you happen to have an art scroll sitter handy, you can find the Animamin on page 178. Seven, eight. You can find Yigdal on page 14. 14. So stay tuned for that. Are you listen to him? No. no. This is Peter. Listen to him. 178. <laughs> Animamin and Yigdal on 14. Okay. The, uh, Leadership you I love you all. Okay, now we have to hope that the uh, people who join us uh, as we go along, who are not automatically muted, will behave. Otherwise, I have to <clears throat> mute them one by one. Sorry about that. Okay. okay. Sorry, let me get my light on so you can see what I'm doing here. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Rambam's 13 Principles of Faith. And sorry, I'm busy muting people again. <clears throat> Today, we are going to do principle number six and seven, please, God. We've got a lot to get through. Principle number six is prophecy. Yes. Uh, um, thank you for reminding me, but we have already been uh, asked to uh, dedicate tonight's shir in memory of one of our members who has yard site, whose yard site is tonight. And let me just get it up here. Um, sorry. Uh, Linda Milner got in first. And uh, it is her late husband's, uh, Michael's yard site tonight. So 
So this is in memory of Mote Beto Ben Chona Mendel Milner. Okay. Now, prophecy, principle number six, Animamin. Uh, Animamin Ben Muna Shlema, I believe with complete perfect faith that all the words of the prophets are true. That's from the Animamin. In Yigdal, we say, um, he granted his flow of prophecy to his treasured, splendorous people. Now, the basic idea here and why it is a fundamental principle of faith is that God communicates to man. God communicates to man is very, very important because it teaches us, we need the prophets to teach us how to live our lives. What is our value system, our do's and don'ts? Not everything is laid out in the Torah clearly and explicitly all the time. Our teachers, particularly our prophets, clarified the laws of Torah for us. So the prophets are very important. Secondly, the fact that God communicates to human beings proves that he is still involved in the world. He didn't just create the world once upon a time and now he's on holiday, he's alive and well and uh, soaking up the sun in Mauritius. He's not retired, he's not semi-retired. And the world is not running on autopilot either. So people say, okay, he's the creator, but is he still managing the world? Maybe not. So when we know that God communicates to us long after creation, and even long after Mount Sinai, that means that he is still most definitely involved in every aspect of the universe. As we've discussed previously, he is the continuous and constant master of the universe and manager of the universe. Very important, both. Not just creator, but ongoing manager of the universe. He runs the world. Thirdly, belief in the prophets of Israel is part of our belief in God itself, himself. It is a continuation of the unique infiniteness and omnipotence of God himself. The fact that he shares his infinite wisdom with finite men and women is an incredible message. And it's part of the infinity of God that he can be equally at home in the finite world. And we say in the, uh, just before the Oz Yoshir, it's from the Chumash, we say it every morning in Shachris, Vayaminu Bashem of Moshe Avda. And the people, when they saw the splitting of the sea, they believed in Hashem, and they believed in Moshe, his servant. Moshe, the, the chief prophet, as we'll learn just now in principle number seven. Now, I must remind you that as we said in the first session in our introduction, Ani Mamin and Yigdal were not written by the Rambam himself. That was written by different rabbis uh, generations later. And the words in Ani Mamin say, that all the words of the prophets are true. And the commentaries point out that that's not exactly what the Rambam says here in principle number six, to be honest. That belongs more accurately, some say, in principle number eight, where we'll talk about the entire Torah being true. Principle number six is the basic fact that there are prophets, that there is prophecy, that Hashem graciously reaches out and communicates to man. <clears throat> and I didn't say men and women. So for all our uh, feminists participating, let me assure you that not only men were prophets, there were female prophetesses as well. The Talmud tells us that there were 48 male prophets and seven female prophetesses of the Jewish people. The Talmud qualifies and says there were actually over a million prophets in the course of time. But those prophets <clears throat> didn't necessarily have a message to the people or to the world. It was a personal prophecy, <clears throat> personal revelations. 
and inspirations. But the prophets that we know are the ones who had a message for us, an important message for the generation. And of course, I'm not going to go through the list of all 48 prophets, but you know, Samuel the prophet, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Elio, Elisha, Daniel. Another story, there was a, a guy once got involved with the uh, Jews for Jay, the Hebrew Christians. So the rabbi says to this young man, he says, what, what inspired you? Why, why, why are you going off in that, in that wayward direction? You're a nice Jewish boy from a nice Jewish family. Where, where are you getting messed up with these guys? What inspired you there? He says, Rabbi, you know what inspired me? The prophets, such powerful men, those prophets. He says, which prophets are you talking about? He says, Isaiah, Jeremiah. He says, my boy, those are Jewish prophets. You don't have to become a, a Christian to go to Jeremiah and Isaiah. So those are the prophets we know. The female prophets, I'll, I'll list all seven for you. How's that? Sarah, Miriam, Devorah, Hannah, two that you probably may not have heard of, Abigail, Abigail, Hulda, and the last one is Esther, Queen Esther, the heroine of the Purim story, who had a whole book of holy scripture of the Tanakh named after her, Megillus Esther, the scroll of Esther. Okay, now the Rambam goes into a long list of the requirements for a human being to be granted prophecy by God. It has to be a holy person, one who has developed his or her intellect, character, piety to the very highest degree. Briefly, a tzaddik and a Torah scholar who has the following qualities as well. Strong character, great intelligence, total control over his emotions and impulses, meaning he has mastered his yetzahod, mastered his evil inclination. He has purified and sanctified himself. He has a clear mind divested of the vanities of the material world. This material world does not distract him. The glitz and the glamour means nothing to him. He contemplates the wisdom of God in everything he sees around him. The Talmud in the Dorim 38a says uh, some of the qualities a prophet needs is to be strong, wealthy, wise, and humble. I will talk about that later. I hope we have time to get back to that because you may have some questions. Why does he have to be strong, physically strong and wealthy? Why does a prophet? Stay tuned. I hope to get back to that. Here's a quote from the Rambam himself from his Mishnah Torah, Magnum Opus. When one becomes worthy of divine inspiration and attains this spirit, he becomes a different person completely. He becomes like an angel far above the level of ordinary men and women, unquote. Now, obviously, there are many different levels of prophecy, uh, each one unique to the individual. No two are necessarily identical. All depends on the exact caliber and worthiness and spirituality of the uh, individual in question. What is common, though, is how prophecy manifests itself in the average prophet. Unlike Moses, I say average prophet, unlike Moses. Moses is on a different level. We'll talk about him just now. How does God manifest? How does God reveal himself to the prophet? In a dream or in a vision at nighttime. And it is an absolutely traumatic experience for the prophet. His limbs tremble. His body becomes faint. He loses control over all his other thoughts and can only focus on the current prophetic experience, nothing else. Furthermore, God's message to the average prophet is in allegory, using metaphors. But the prophet understands what the meaning is immediately. For example, Jacob, in this famous dream of the ladder with the angels going up and down, ascending and descending on the, la the ladder that went from earth to heaven, that is a metaphor for the ups and downs of Israel and the Jewish people and the empires that would subjugate Jacob's descendants in later generations. 
Ezekiel famously saw the Merkava, the chariot. And there were animals schlepping this chariot up in heaven. What, God, God is the rider and there's, there's, there, there, there's oxen and eagles in heaven. What's going on here? Clearly, it's allegorical. Clearly, these are metaphors. Jeremiah saw a boiling pot, an almond tree rod, and so on and so forth. Each prophet had their own visions. The prophecy may sometimes be for the prophet himself, for his own edification. But very often in the prophecies that we know and what the Tanakh is full of, the stories of the, of the prophets, is where they interacted with the people, where they had a message for their generation at the time. God was telling them some important uh, message to tell the people, repent before it's too late or whatever it might be, or the temple will be destroyed if you don't repent, and so on and so forth. So the, prophet, the prophecy may be for uh, himself, maybe for a group of people, maybe for a specific city, like the story of Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. You read on Yom Kippur afternoon, he had a message for the city of Nineveh, a non-Jewish city, a great metropolis. Um, or it may be for the entire nation. So most of the prophets generally had a message for the, for the nation, for the people. And the prophet would be given a miracle to perform to demonstrate his authenticity and bona fides as a genuine prophet of God. So the people would believe his words. However, very important, miracles alone are not enough. Because how do we know it's a genuine miracle? Maybe he's a magician. Maybe he's a fortune teller. Maybe he's a trickster or a fake. Therefore, he had to have been known and his reputation had to be established before his, his prophecy, had to be known that he's a pious and righteous person before he starts prophesying. Now, in the Chumash, we read explicitly, explicitly about the false prophet. Devarim, Deuteronomy chapter 13. If there should arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he will produce for you a sign or a wonder, i.e. a miracle. And the sign or wonder comes about. And he says, let us go and follow other gods or the gods of others and worship them. Do not hearken to his words. For Hashem, your God, is testing you to know whether you love Hashem with all your heart and soul. Unquote from the Chumash. What is the Torah telling us? The Torah is telling us in advance, you should know there will arise false prophets in history. And they may very well perform quite impressive miracles. Still, do not be impressed. Do not listen to them. If they tell you to worship false and foreign gods, if they tell you to do something which is against the Torah, that itself proves that they are false prophets, because the Torah, as we'll read in the later principle, is not negotiable. So you may ask, if they're a false prophet, how could they perform a miracle? Why did God allow them to perform a miracle? And the answer is, says the Torah, Hashem because God is testing you. He's testing you to see, do you really love him? Do you follow Hashem properly? Or you're going to be easily swayed, easy, easy, easily influenced and persuaded and bamboozled by every charlatan with a glib tongue who may happen to be a charismatic speaker. You know, we have lots of prophets in Africa who are very charismatic. And they fleece you for your money, but that's a different story. So even if this so-called prophet may walk on water, but then he tells you that the Torah is old and we need now a new version. Do not follow him. He's a false prophet. Ramam continues and says there may be other categories of people that we have to be wary of not to follow, not just false prophets, but people like astrologers. You know, I, there used to be a, a program on the radio here uh, some woman astrologer, she would uh, take calls at night and people would call up and ask, uh, 
Should I marry him or her? Should I emigrate or not? Should I buy the house or not buy the house? And she would look up in the stars and from the, stu from the radio studio, she would give answers. And I couldn't believe how, 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 how gullible people were. They were asking really important life questions and, 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 and seemingly taking her advice. But the Ramam says, if you encounter an astrologer or a fortune teller, or uh, let me euphemize the Rambam and say a gypsy lady with a crystal ball, or maybe perhaps even a Jewish woman who levitates in her garage in the suburbs and may communicate with the dead. And then he or she tells you things that sound like prophecy and you are very impressed. You must know that none of these are necessarily true, authentic, or reliable, and it's certainly not kosher to listen and follow to these people. It's absolutely chazer treif and strictly forbidden to follow. Do these individuals meet the criteria of a genuine prophet that I listed before, which the Rambam spoke about? No way. So if they're not these tzaddikim and pious individuals, one of two things, either they are take charlatans and you are gullible and being deceived, or they may be very good at their game. They may have certain skills, maybe sorcery, maybe black magic, or some form of spiritualism, and they have a gift they're able to communicate, but we're told not to do that. So even if they know certain things and there may be some truth in what they say, it is still forbidden to follow them. So either they may be charlatans, and even if they're not charlatans and they do have something to them, they do have certain powers, you're still not allowed to follow them. They are not prophets of God. If anything, they are representatives of the forces of evil the forces of darkness. Because if they're not tzaddikim, if they're not righteous people connected to Hashem through His Torah, how do they get this information? It's not coming from the forces of light, so it may well be coming from the forces of darkness. Beware. Now the Rambam speaks in detail about astrology and says that astrology may have some elements of truth sometimes, but it is not reliable and it is often very distorted. And the famous example is the astrologers of Pharaoh back in Egypt in the Chumash with Moses. The astrologers of Pharaoh told him that the savior of Israel who will be born will meet his fate with water. So what did Pharaoh do? He decreed that all newborn Jewish baby boys should be drowned in the Nile River. In the end, what happened? Moses was saved by Pharaoh's own daughter in the, in the basket in the, river, in the river and went on to become the savior of Israel. What about the astrologer's prediction that he would meet his fate with water? There was some truth in that, but it was distorted. What was the truth? Moshe was denied entry into his beloved promised land of Israel. Why? Because he struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock to get water from the rock. So it was in a story, in an episode to do with water where Moshe had something of a downfall. So they did see something, the astrologers, but it's not clear and therefore not reliable. And we're not allowed to listen to astrologers. So please, if you get the newspaper delivered to your doorstep every morning, or you wake up in the morning and you uh, go onto uh, the internet and look up the horoscope. You know how to spell horoscope, H-O-R-R-O-R-S-C-O-P-E, horror scope. And it tells you where if you're, uh, if this is a bad day for Aquarius people and you decide, well, I'm staying in bed today, I'm not going to work. That is strictly forbidden by the Torah. So, Astrologers and others may have something, but it's not necessarily accurate, nor is it reliable, nor is it permissible. 
The era of prophecy lasted roughly a thousand years. From Moshe to the prophet Malachi, the last of the prophets of old. After that, there was no longer any full-blown biblical prophecy as in those times. Of course, Baruch Hashem, we uh, still had and continue to have many righteous leaders, spiritual leaders and visionaries. But we'll talk more about that later. Don't go away. Okay. I'm going to go on to principle number seven. And then we'll come back to talk, touch on some of the things that I said we'd leave for later. I hope we'll have time. Uh, our, uh, two people are telling me they don't hear me. Uh, am I not being heard? No, I can hear you, Rabbi. Thank you. Okay, so m maybe you must turn up your mic there. It seems that most people do not have a problem. Sorry for that interruption. Okay, principle number seven, the prophecy of Moses. And I quote from the Animamin. Art School Cedar, page 178, has it, if you have it handy. An imamin, Shlema, I believe, with complete perfect faith. Shenevuat Moshe Rabbeinu, Olo Vasholem Hoito Amitit. I believe with complete, the prophecy of Moses, our teacher, peace upon him, was true, and that he was the father of all the prophets, both those who preceded him and those who followed after him. Or in Yigdal on page 14 in the Art Scroll Sitter, Lokam be Yisrael Kemoshe O Noviuma Bit Etimunato. Sounds familiar? In Israel, none like Moses arose again, a prophet who perceived his vision, Hashem's vision, clearly. Okay, what is this telling us? Moshe as a prophet was unique. He achieved the highest possible level a human being is capable of, according to Maimonides. And Hashem himself testified in the Torah to the uniqueness of Moshe's prophecy. In Bamidbar, the end of Parshas Baaloscha, we have the story how Miriam and Aaron were talking about Moshe, how he had separated from his wife because God was always appearing to him. And he had to be in a state of purity constantly. And they thought, well, they're prophets too, and they're still living normal married lives. Why does Moses have to be holier than thou? And God was displeased that they were speaking losh about Moshe. And Miriam was struck with Tzoraz, the leprous curse. And listen to the words in the Bible, how God himself defends Moses. And I quote, Hear now my words, he says to Miriam and Aaron. If there be prophets among you, in a vision shall I, Hashem, make myself known to him. In a dream shall I speak to him. Not so my servant Moshe. In my entire house, he is the trusted one. Mouth to mouth do I speak to him. In a clear vision and not in riddles, no metaphors or allegories. At the image of Hashem does he gaze. Why were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Unquote, asks God of Miriam and Aaron, Moshe's siblings. So we see clearly in the words of God in the Bible itself that Moses' level of prophecy was unlike any other. Unlike the other prophets, we said, they see God in a dream or a trance or an allegory, a riddle. Moshe was able to be communicated to with Hashem wide awake clear, cool, calm, and collective, like we are having a conversation now. And Moshe had easy 
access, almost open door policy, instant and easy access to God, almost at, at will. Two famous incidents in the Bible, both in the book of Numbers, Pesach Sheni, Numbers chapter 9, the second Passover, there were people who were Tome, and they couldn't participate in the Passover offering in the wilderness, and they came to Moshe complaining, Lomo Nigora, why should we be left out? Why should we suffer? We were doing a mitzvah. Some say they were carrying the remains of Joseph. What does Moshe say? Im stand by and I will hear what Hashem commands you. You have a question? Okay, stick around, says Moshe. Hang on a minute. I'll be right back. Let me go ask the boss. Give me a minute. <laughs> Can you believe that? Stand and listen. That's what he's saying. Hang on a minute. I'll be right back. I'll ask God and we'll know the answer. He had instant, immediate access. No one on earth throughout history could say those words. Moshe was unique. The second example was towards the end of the book of Numbers, by Midbar 27, the daughters of Tzlovchad. Tzlovchad died, left no sons, five daughters. They say in Yiddish. And they come to Moses, our father died, left no sons. Why shouldn't we, his daughters, inherit our father's estate in the promised land? They love the holy land, the promised land. They're about to go into Israel. And they want to have their father's share in the land. So what does it say? And Moses brought their claim before Hashem. And the very next verse, Hashem said to Moshe, the daughters of Tzlovchad speak well. They are quite right. Give them their father's estate. That's the din of Jewish inheritance. If there's no sons, the daughters should get it. So only Moses had instant access to God. In the sports world, they would call him the goat, eh? greatest of all time. Moshe was the greatest prophet of all time. Now, why did the people believe Moses and his prophetic teachings? Was it because of all the amazing miracles he performed? And he performed the most amazing miracles of any prophet. And the answer is no. Yes, he may have managed the 10 plagues in Egypt, orchestrated the exodus, split the sea, brought down manna from heaven, given them water from a rock, created an earthquake to swallow the evil Korach and his henchmen, each one an amazing, mind-blowing miracle. But the main reason the people believed and trusted Moshe was none of the above. None of the above, not the miracles. What then was the main source of Moshe's credibility as a prophet of Hashem? The answer is, very important, Mount Sinai. The greatest revelation in history where the entire Jewish nation, millions of men, women, and children experienced revelation, heard and saw Hashem speaking to them, giving them the Ten Commandments, the thunder, the lightning, the mountain quaking, the shofar sounding, or the whole amazing, unique, once-in-a-lifetime experience. Moshe's prophecy was proven beyond a shadow of a doubt during the revelation at Sinai. Exodus 19, verse 9. Hashem said to Moshe, Behold, I come to you in the thickness of the cloud, so that the people will hear as I speak to you, and they will also believe in you forever. Words of God. Hashem says to Moshe, when they see my interaction with you at this revelation at Mount Sinai, then they will believe in you forever. In other words, before Mount Sinai, before the revelation, the people's faith in Moshe's authenticity as a prophet of God 
was based on all the miracles he performed from the staff becoming the snake in the beginning when he introduced himself, when he came from the burning bush, but it was not complete. And it was not strong or reliable enough to last for posterity. It was based on the miracles, but now at the revelation of Sinai, when millions of Jews saw and heard how Hashem spoke to Moshe, they heard the first two of the Ten Commandments very clearly from Hashem, and then they were freaking out. They were overdosing on divine revelation, and they felt that their souls are going to leave their bodies, and they couldn't hand it any longer. And they said, Moshe, Moshe, you, you intercede for us. You, you listen to Hashem, and you tell us the rest. And so he did. The next eight of the Ten Commandments, Hashem gave Moshe, and Moshe gave the children of Israel. So they saw Moses go up the mountain. They saw Moses come down the mountain with the Ten Commandments on the two tablets. They saw how Hashem clearly, obviously chose Moses as his main emissary, and they saw it all with their very own eyes. Thus, says the Rambam, the revelation at Sinai is the absolute proof that Moshe's prophecy was true. They were eyewitnesses to this historical event. They could see clearly there was no deception, no trickery, and no further proof was required as to why they challenged Moshe throughout the years and the 40 years, that that's, that's a different discussion. Now, the question is, why is it so important? Why must this be one of the 13 major fundamental principles of faith? We're talking about the 13 most important principles of the whole Jewish faith. Why is Moses' unique level of prophecy one of the fundamentals that is so important? And the answer is, and the Rama writes this, so that if anyone should ever come along and seems to be making miracles and wonders and then tells you to abandon the Torah that Moshe taught us, or to even change, deviate from the Torah ever so slightly, you should know that person is not to be believed or accepted. He is a false prophet. Because Moses has been completely authenticated as the truest prophet of all, and his word stands forever. Indeed, do we not live with the Chumash? And what do we call the Chumash? The five books of Moses. And Moses was up on the mountain for 40 days. He came down and before he left this world, he gave us the written Torah, the five books of Moses. The 40 days he studied by Hashem up on Mount Sinai, Hashem gave him the whole Torah in its entirety, way beyond just the five books, the whole Talmud, the whole, all of Jewish law. Took Moshe 40 years. He got the Torah age 80, passed away age 120. Last week, seventh of Adar was his yard site. What he learned in 40 days on the mountain took him 40 years to convey, to teach to the children of Israel. What did he teach? He gave them the written Torah. He taught them the oral Torah. What would later become the Mishnah, the Talmud, the Shulchan Aruch, the Rambam, etc., was taught by Moshe. That is the oral tradition, which was taught by him for 40 years. Then there's also another thing in the Gemara. From time to time, the Gemara looks for sources. Why? Where do we get this law from? And sometimes it, it exhausts the search is exhausted. We can't find anything in scripture. We can't find any logical proof. And the end, you know what the answer is? Why we do this tradition? Halocha lemoshe misinai. If you study the Talmud, you'll come across that now and then. It is a halocha, it is a law 
that was handed down to us for generations all the way back from Moses at Mount Sinai. So we don't have it in writing, we don't have chapter and verse, but there's a tradition that was faithfully transmitted generation to generation, teacher to disciple through the ages, and it all goes back to our locha that Moses got at Mount Sinai. You know, in the story of Korach, who was uh, swallowed in the earthquake in the end for challenging the leadership of Moses and Aaron, there's a, uh, a Talmudic tradition that after they were swallowed by the earth, it's gone, finito. If you put your ear to the ground, you could hear words emanating from beneath the ground. What were the words? Four Hebrew words. Moshe emes v'torato emes. Moshe was true and his Torah is true. So now we can understand a strange line in the story of the burning bush. Exodus, Exodus chapter 3 verse 12. Now as you all know the story, Moshe is a shepherd for his father-in-law Jethro. He happens to see this burning bush experience. God is appearing to him for the very first time in his life. Moshe is a humble, simple shepherd, and God charges him with responsibility. Go down to Egypt, tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. You're going to be the savior. You're going to take my children out of slavery. And Moshe is overwhelmed. He's a reluctant leader, Moshe. He's, he's, he's so humble. We know the Torah says that Moshe was the humblest of all men on the face of the earth. So God shows him miracles to persuade him to go down to Egypt. And Moshe says, Mi Anochi, who am I? I should go to Pharaoh? Me? Little old me? I'm just a simple shepherd. And what does God say to Moshe? For I shall be with you. And then he adds this very important enigmatic line. And this is your sign that I have sent you. When you take the people out of Egypt, you will serve God on this mountain. The burning bush was actually on Mount Sinai. So what is the ultimate sign that Hashem sent Moses, that he is the prophet of God, that Moses is the prophet par excellence, the chief prophet of all ages, before and after? The answer is this verse that I just read. Hashem told Moshe, the burning bush, that you will serve Hashem on this very mountain, meaning the revelation at Mount Sinai. Not the other miracles. As great as all the other miracles was, Exodus splitting the sea, water from rocks, doesn't matter. The revelation at Sinai where the people saw God speaking to Moshe and through Moshe to the people, that would prove conclu conclusively that Moshe was the chosen one, the chosen prophet of Hashem. And that uh, gives us a lot of insight into that verse, which seemingly didn't make sense. They're sitting in the, what's the sign? The sign that you are, the, is that when you go out of Egypt, uh, There'll be something on this mountain. It's a sign in the future. But indeed, Hashem was telling us that that would be the ultimate sign that would establish Moshe's authenticity forever. And not the miracles. Here's a question some of you may have been thinking of. Who's greater, Moshe or Mashiach? Principle number 12 is Mashiach. So we still have a way to get there. The last uh, lecture in this series will deal with Mashiach. So the Rambam writes that Mashiach will be close to Moshe in prophecy, unquote. Close to Moshe, meaning a close second. Moshe is even greater than Mashiach in prophecy, according to the Rambam. But Mashiach is also going to be the greatest, no? So in prophecy, he'll be close to Moshe. But in sovereignty, he'll be greater than Moshe. 
what is the title of Mashiach? Is he a uh, Kohen? He's not a Kohen. Is he a rabbi? Maybe a rabbi, but that's not his title. Is he a prophet? Maybe a prophet. But what is his title? His title is Melech. Melech HaMoshiach. King Moshiach. That's why he has to be a descendant of King David. But we'll talk more about that in the last lesson. Okay. I want to... Um, I see there are some questions. Uh, let's see here what we have uh, on the chat line. Sally Berger, should Hashem not have forgiven Moshe and then allowed him to enter the promised land? Sally, I'm on your page. I agree. Hashem should have forgiven Moshe. It's a, it's a tragedy that Moshe didn't get into the promised land. But that's another whole lecture, which we don't have time for now, I'm afraid. But I'd love to discuss it with you another time. Um, the greater you are, the more a mistake is considered grave. I give the example of a, a, a stain on a silk tie. A stain on a silk tie ruins the tie. A stain on a pair of jeans is desirable. The more stains, the better. Moshe was like a silk tie, and even a tiny little stain was a problem. Okay, we don't have more time because there's still more stuff I need to get through. And let me uh, deal with this now. Now, so we said the end of prophecy, prophecy lasted a thousand years and ended the, uh, end of the temple and end of the prophetic area, era. But there are different types of divine revelation and divine inspiration that we read about through the years. For example, there's something called the Batkol, a heavenly voice that rings out from Mount Sinai or others. In the Talmud, there are stories of Batkal, heavenly voices that came out and said a certain person uh, has a share in the world to come or, or forfeited their share, whatever. Then there's something called Gilu Eliyahu, a revelation of Elijah the prophet. Some people merit the stories in the Talmud of rabbis who merited that Eliyahu, Anavi, Elijah the prophet, revealed himself to them. We're all going to have Eliyahu at our homes at the Pesach Seder, please God. But we don't see him, right? Unless we've already had four cups and we think we see him. So, um, but some people merit to have a revelation of Eliyahu and he can reveal certain secrets to them. There's a, a cute story I'll tell you quickly. I mentioned in Shul not so long ago. There was a fellow about 200 years ago, back in Europe, he read in a, in a book that if you don't speak for 40 days, any nonsense, you just daven and learn Torah, you'll merit the revelation of Elijah the prophet, Gilu Elio. So he did, went on a tainus dibra, a fast of speaking. Besides davening and learning, he did not say a, a, one single word of ordinary conversation for 40 days. Sadly, he did not merit the revelation of Elio. So he decided to go to the Rizhen Rebbe, Rabbi Yisrael of Rizhen, who was not too far from him. He was reputed to be a tzaddik, a holy man, to ask him a question. But he was very unimpressed by the conduct of this Rabbi Yisrael of Rizhen, this supposedly great tzaddik. Uh, and he decided he's not even going to bother asking him. The Rizhen obviously uh, concealed his greatness. In fact, after Shabbos, he sees, he's about to leave, and he sees the Rizhina standing there by a horse, patting the horse's mane. This is now too much for him. A holy rabbi, like a stable boy, is behaving. So he goes up to him. He says, Rabbi, feh, pasnik, is this, this is so unbecoming of an of a, of a important rabbi like you, petting the horse. You know what the Rizhina said to him? He said, hey. Don't talk badly about my horse. You know that this horse has not said a single word for the last 40 days. <laughs> What's the message? That just not speaking alone doesn't merit you the revelation of Elijah. You have to be on a, on a holy level. Otherwise, you're like a fair, you know. Now, we've had many tzaddikim long since the official end of prophecy. In every generation, we have been blessed with, if not full-blown prophets, Sadiqim, 
and the Rosh Hashivas and the Rebbes and, and spiritual leaders of, of great stature. Baal Shem Tov stories uh, abound with, with miracles of, of how he saw things from one end of the world to the other. How do these righteous people, tzaddikim, that people ask questions, and they seem to be miracle workers, how do they answer a question of what's going on the other side of the world? They have no knowledge. So the first verse of the Torah, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Heaven and earth are two sides to the same universe. Meaning there is a spiritual and physical reality to the world. We see the physical, usually only the physical. A tzaddik, however, who has developed his spirituality to the highest levels, is able to sense the spiritual side of things. The Gemara says, every blade of grass has a spiritual force telling it to grow. There's spiritual in every physical. So if the tzaddik might be on the other side of the world and does not see the exact physical circumstances of what we're asking about, he may still see the spiritual side. And by understanding the spiritual, the spiritual reality, he can make a very educated comment about the physical reality. And he can advise us physically what to do unerringly. And that is how for us in South Africa, my saintly teacher of righteous memory, the Rebbe's repeated reassurances that our country will be good for us until Mashiach comes, is credible, is reliable, and all those who still worry and have doubts should take a chill powder because all will be good, please God. Final story. I read this this week. In July, 1968, the only time an El Al plane was hijacked. It was hijacked by the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine and taken to Algiers. And it was a long protracted uh, hostage story. And the behind the scenes, a, one of the behind the scenes story is this, which many people don't know. Former Prime Minister of Israel and a decorated Israeli war hero, Ariel Arik Sharon. Had a relationship with the Rebbe over many years. They corresponded and Sharon visited the Rebbe on a number of occasions. And on one occasion, it was in, 19, in July 1968, he came to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe asked him when he's leaving, and he told him. And the Rebbe told him not to leave then on that flight. It turned out to be that El Al flight that was hijacked by Palestinian terrorists and taken to Algiers. Arik Sharon listened and he did not travel on that flight. Now, can you imagine, God forbid, if the Palestinian terrorists had Arik Sharon in their hands? God alone knows what kind of sort of that would have been, God forbid. So I read an article written by a rabbi, Zeb Siegel, a non-Chabad rabbi, quite a prominent rabbi. He was the president of the Rabbinical Council of America. He was a rabbi in New Jersey for many years. And he heard the story and he, and, and he had questions. So when he went to see the Rebbe, he asked him directly, he said, Rebbe, is it true? Did you tell Sharon not to take that plane? And if you knew that the plane was gonna be hijacked, why didn't you tell everybody? And the Rebbe said, you think I knew they would hijack the plane? I didn't know that. But I had a sense, I had a feeling, a premonition that he should not go. So I told him to stay, unquote. So what do we see? It might not be prophecy exactly like in biblical times, but clearly it's what we call Ruach HaKodesh, a Holy Spirit, a divine inspiration that Sadiqim, 
of the Rebbe's caliber and that we've had, we've been blessed with Sadiqim through the generations, we're able to have that sense of divine inspiration to know things that ordinary mortals could not see, could not know. And they'd be able to guide people and save lives. Okay, I have uh, one more quick vert. I have actually much more, but we're running out of time. So let me just share with you one final vote. And that is, I touched on it earlier. The Talmud and the Dorim said that one of the, some of the characteristics and, and the criteria for a person to be a prophet, he should be uh, strong, wise and humble, strong and wealthy. So the commentary asked the question, wise and humble, we understand. Why should a prophet have to be strong physically and wealthy? Why a prophet needs to be uh, uh, a mighty uh, wrestler, a boxer, what? And, and he has to be a rich person. We're looking for different qualities. So there's different answers. One answer is, and the Rambam says this, that when the when the Talmud says strong, it means like it says in Birkei Avot. Who is strong? He who conquers his passion. Not Samson or Hercules. A moral strength. When it says wealthy, what does it mean? Also Birkei Avot. Who is wealthy? He who is content with his lot. Doesn't have to have a lot of money in the bank. He has to be content. There's another answer also. I heard a very cute answer which uh, I thought I'll share with you to end. So one of the criteria is you have to be humble. But if you're weak and poor, it's no chap to be humble. <laughs> you have nothing not to be humble about. But if you're strong and rich and you're still humble, oh, that's an accomplishment. That's something to write home about. A person who's strong, powerful, and rich, and still he's humble, that shows a special character. This is a special individual worthy of prophecy. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the shir for tonight. Thank you very much for listening. You're welcome to unmute yourselves and ask questions. I'm happy to hang around a bit. Next week, please God, we'll do another two principles about the authenticity of the Torah. Okay, so we spoke about God, now we spoke about prophecy, and next week we get on to the Torah itself. I'm happy to take questions, comments, but you'll have to unmute yourselves. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Father, thanks. Good night, Tom. Good night. Good you. night, and thank you for joining. I'm pleased to see we had uh, nearly 100 people again. So thank you for listening. Thank you for your thanks. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you, uh, Iris, Shulamit, Eric, Sally. Audrey and Mitch, I hope uh, you were able to hear me. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Welcome, Samantha. Yes. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Rabbi. You're very welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Rabbi. You're welcome, yes. Esther. Thank you. Thanks, Rabbi. Good night. You're very welcome, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi. Good night. Thank you for your very kind comments. Does that mean there's no questions? I answered all the questions. You did. Very well. Thank you, Stan. What? Thank you. Thank Mom. you, Freda. You listening to? And Bernice. Comments. Rabbi, Rabbi, can I ask a question? Yes, you may. Thank you. The, the prophets, um, if they are buried and are, it's Ross Finkelstein. Yes, if yes, they are, 
exhumed. The, the bodies are complete. Never read anything about that, but uh, we have stories of great rabbis and mm. even, uh, even ordinary people uh, in our own community whose bodies were exhumed uh, a year later and were intact. Uh, that's certainly the exception. I haven't seen it written as any law about uh, the prophets, but uh, I would not uh, be at all surprised if it uh, happens to people in our own generations, mm. then uh, it would stand to reason that it may well be the case for the prophets. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sally Berger, how's Cape Town? Yeah, good weather here. Anyway, I thoroughly, I thoroughly enjoyed your talk this evening. Thank you, Sally, from the Garden Show. Nice to see you. <laughs> uh, Rabbi? Yes. Joel Bloomberg, good evening. Um, does, does the 13 principles of faith deal with the moral um, principles, or do we find that in the Pekaya board? No, no. This is not morality, this is theology. This is the philosophical belief system. What do Jews believe? What does a Jew have to believe in order to be considered a believing Jew? So it's not just enough to, oh, I believe in God. That's principle number one. But we have to also believe another 12 things. So, so far we've gotten through just over half. We've just finished number seven and we still have three more sessions. We'll do two each and do the, the other six. Right, thank you. Do you, do you, do you have, a, wh which sitter do you have at home? Um, I've got the, um, the art scroll. Okay, so I gave the pages. You can get a quick overview. The art scroll sitter, page 178. Mm. Yeah. We'll get, uh, a, a brief overview of the 13 principles of faith and uh, what it's about. Right. So, so for moral issues like uh, justice and charity and, and yeah, yeah. We, we have a, we have a whole Torah. We have we have 613 yeah. mitzvahs, uh, which right. uh, dozens and dozens are are on moral issues and ethical issues. But these are principles of faith. Here we're right. speaking about faith, theology, okay. not practice. It's not telling us what we must do, how we must behave. It's telling mm -hmm. us strictly it's limited to what we must believe. Right. Hello, Joe Bloomberg in London. How nice to have people in London tuning in. Speaking up from Woody Inn. Wow, we I'm so flattered. And even the assassins in Pretoria. Wow, wonderful. <laughs> the miracles of Zoom, eh? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Rabbi. I wish you a happy and freilich of Purim. Purim is Thursday night, Friday. Don't forget the Purim mitzvahs to listen to the Megillah Thursday night and Friday. To give Shalach Manas food gifts to friends, charity to two poor people. And have a festive Purim meal on Friday morning this year because it's Erev Shabbos. And we say Al Hanissim. Purim Shabbos. Sorry? Put him some air, put him some air, put him some air. Zai gesund, everybody.